G'day. The life of a backyard astronomer has never been better than it is now during the pandemic. We are having the time of our lives. While everyone else is running out of stuff to watch on Netflix and lamenting the fact they can't go anywhere, us backyard astronomers basically have a near infinite universe to observe and enjoy. We've been socially isolated since before it was cool. This is our moment. That is, if your equipment hasn't been delayed and tied up in customs because of all these issues with these supply chains going on at the moment, which is ironic because we have more money now, we can't go anywhere, we've been saving, so of course we're going to spend our money on astronomy equipment. We've got nowhere else to spend it. And today I'm going to have a hands-on play with the QHY268C which is a fair bit more expensive than my 24-7C. It's a very similar camera, but it has some key differences. And because it's so much more expensive, when QHY reached out to me and asked if I'd like to try it, I said, go on. So join me and do what astronomers do best, other than talk about the weather and roast each other for fake astro photos. Let's talk about equipment. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. <laughs> This video is sponsored by High Point Scientific, an astronomy vendor from the United States who support their equipment and have a price match guarantee. They are a dealer in QHY equipment, which I'll talk about in this video quite a bit. So really, unless you have like an iPhone one and you can't load their website for some reason, there really isn't any other reason why you wouldn't go to High Point Scientific. Drop my name and tell them I sent you. So as you'd expect, the QHY box is beautiful. After unwrapping this precious cargo, I thought, sweet Jesus, why is this thing so huge? Why is this camera so big? I saw Trevor posting about the same camera on Twitter and my fragile masculinity was glad I got the bigger one. But I didn't know why it was bigger, so I tweeted at QHYCCD, who let me know this model comes in three different flavors, photographic, early bird, and pro. So the prices range from about 2K to 3K USD, but they all use the same Sony IMX571 chip. Now I don't have 3K just lying around, especially 3K USD. So I was trying really hard not to drop this camera. I'm gonna show you a stunning image of the M8 Lagoon Nebula that I took as the first light test image for this camera, because really that's all that matters is what these results look like. But before we get there, let's just go over some of these key specs for this camera. The professional version, which I've got here, has the gigabit fiber optic cables to shoot images at the speed of light to your computer. And that's something I've never really heard of in the amateur astronomy scene. If anyone's using fiber optic to download the images from the camera, let me know. That sounds really interesting. That sounds like professional observatory stuff, certainly above my pay grade. This 268C is actually a true 16-bit color camera. Now you'll see the different uh, bit rates on different cameras and essentially what this means with a true 16-bit color camera you get a high dynamic range by stacking less images. You don't need as many. Some popular cameras like the um, ZWO1600mm are only 12-bit. Now you can get similar results but you do need to stack more images to get those results. The QHY 24-7C camera that I have is a 14-bit camera and it does very well. But again, I'll be able to get away with less frames with a camera like this. So this Sony chip is in a few different cameras, uh, different astronomy cameras and a few DSLRs, I believe, as well. So the main difference uh, you have here when you're selecting different brands is what other features set this particular camera apart. Now, obviously, we've got the fiber optic cables, but it's also the other features like the inbuilt dew heater, the minus 35 degree temperature control, the onboard memory and that kind of thing. But the sensor itself is beautiful at 26 megapixels for a resolution of a bit more than 6,000 by 4,000 pixels, so really high resolution image. It has anti-reflection coating, it's an ASPC size sensor, it's a really nice sensor. Blah, 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 show me the photo already. I know all that matters is the end world results, and we'll get there. I just wanted to go through the basic specs because you need to know this when you're standing around the water cooler with other nerds. But I need to show you one other thing under the bonnet just because it's good. I'm no camera expert, but it does help to understand the camera and what it's capable of. So here is an image of the Dark Master. And this is where I've stacked all the darks together and will show us the inherent noise in the chip. And what I notice here is a definite banding and we've got a normal model of colored noise here, which all of this is predictable noise. So it will all get removed when we do that dark frame subtraction. Uh, what I do notice on this, if I compare it to the 24-7C QHY that I have, 
uh, it's definitely got less amp glow. It's a more even field. So it's nice to know when you're spending more money on a camera like this, you are actually getting a cleaner image in the first place to start with. So I set up the 268C in the Byron Bay Observatory on my Celestron 11 inch, which is a fairly slow telescope and pointed it to a fairly bright nebula M8. This is my high magnification rig, so I'm really going in deep and won't be able to see all of M8. Here's what a single frame looks like with no calibration at all. You can see the green bias, but it's really not as green biased as I'm used to with color cameras, which is interesting. Here's the horizontal banding that I was talking about. This is probably readout noise. And here's the same single frame with some basic color calibration. So removing that green bias so we can see the true color range of the camera. So that's a really good looking single sub, right? You know that when you see subs like this rolling in, that you're gonna end up with a pretty good image at the end. And finally, drum roll please. That's my kid doing his drum rolls. So proud. M8 Lagoon Nebula captured only with 21 frames of three minutes each, the gain set to zero. That's only an hour's worth of data on a relatively slow telescope and a really quick first light with very little data overall. I usually don't image in one shot color as you know, but if immediate results are something you're interested in and your sky is dark enough, I think these results speak for themselves. I'll definitely be using this camera to snatch some more color during this new moon before I have to give this bad boy back to QHY. Thanks for watching that video. If you notice the burn marks, it wasn't from a uh, thermite accident, which is probably more likely. It was because I did some gardening uh, for my wife, Anna. She asked me to remove a plant. This plant had this toxic sap with microscopic calcium oxalate needles, which felt like a thousand ants biting me all at once. And a week later still feels like I have hundreds of mosquito bites all over my arms and hands. So I'm sorry, I wasn't the hand model you might have been expecting for this video. The moral of the story is I don't want to do any more gardening unless it means removing trees, getting in my way of space. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Clear skies to you all. You've been watching Star Stuff. My name is Dylan O'Donnell. Remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die.